after you have this uh, best fit mathematical model, then you can hope that if you put in a new value of RRS, you'll get an estimate of, say, chlorophyll that's reasonably good. And in general, your model here is going to have some kind of unknown parameters, which might be proportionality constants or weighting functions or fitting coefficients, whatever you want to call them. And you're going to determine those parameter values by forcing your model to fit a data set where you know both the inputs and the outputs. So you've got data with RRS spectra for, and, you've got, and the corresponding chlorophylls, and then you find some best fit curve that will turn RRS into a chlorophyll. Okay, so that's why they're called statistical or empirical models is because they really are just determined by fitting uh, some little simple mathematical relationship to a, uh, a data set with known values. Okay, nothing wrong with that. That's how this whole business got started way back when in the days of CZCS. And you come up with things like, you know, this figure you've all seen a million times, and it's incredibly useful. It's completely revolutionized oceanography. So these statistical methods are still what's used for things like Veers or Maris or whatever it happens to be to get things like this out of remote sensing reflectances. So I'm going to talk about two examples of statistical algorithms, band ratio algorithms and neural networks. Okay, so for the band ratio algorithms, where this all got started Back in the days of, of CZCS, Coastal Zone Color Scanner, Ken showed you this figure yesterday where people simply looked at, here we have wavelength, uh, water leaving radiance, and different chlorophyll values. And they looked at this and said, well, gee, suppose we measured somewhere here in the blue, there's a lot of variability depending on chlorophyll, and maybe we measure somewhere here kind of in the green, there's not much variability. So if I look at the ratio of, say, blue to green, if it's a high value, this number divided by that one, I've got a low chlorophyll. If it's a low number, this number divided by that one, then I'd have a high chlorophyll. So there's some kind of obvious looking correlation here that we might be able to use. And that's what started the whole idea. Uh, if you plot up uh, people went out, they got, uh, you know, more curves like this, and then this is band one, two, three, and four. So people would look at the ratio of the band one to the band three, and then plot the log of that ratio versus the log of the chlorophyll, and you get this pretty nice little relation here. Pretty cool. So this suggests that you could write the log of chlorophyll as a constant plus some other constant times the log of the band ratio 1 to 3 is 443 to 550. And simply, you fit the line there, you get the values of the two uh, coefficients, and there's your model. So now you go out, you measure the 443 and the 5 whatever it was band, uh, 550 band, and uh, you plug it into your formula you get back a chlorophyll. This whole thing started with 33 data points. Pretty astounding. Uh, okay, so that's the sort of essence of how a band ratio algorithm works. Yeah, Catherine. Those were 33 data points from satellite? Uh, no, this is from field data. So they went around like Gulf of California and Gulf of Mexico, wherever. They got 33 data points from basically case one waters and then plotted them up and said, hey, this is going to work. Yeah, Mike.
see, Mike. Yeah, somewhere way back then, yeah. CZCS was launched in 86, was it? Seven, okay, so 70. So this is early set, whoops. This is early 70s then, somewhere in the 70s. Maybe it died in 86, I don't remember. It was kind of funny, you know, it was, a, it was a proof of concept thing. It was supposed to go up and fly around for a year, and it lasted, what, like six years or something. And it was called the Coastal Zone Color Scanner. Well, it didn't work very well in coastal waters because they're often case two, but it worked great in the open ocean. So, you know. Uh, Yeah, they actually, yeah, 78 to 86, um, they had uh, 66,000 images. And like Ken said, that was just here today and there tomorrow. But, you know, there's an image there of, here's the Gulf of Maine, so we're sitting right up here somewhere. There's Boston. Um, just phenomenal detail you get of variability in the oceans here. Uh, that you know nobody was expecting anything like that and so this is chlorophyll of point two in the blue to up to 30 in the red up here pretty astounding okay and all it took was a very simple band ratio algorithm yeah Catherine another question yeah the the four visible bands are these four right here uh, 443 out to 670 and then there were two more in the infrared that they used for the atmospheric correction okay so if you go to more recent literature you find much fancier band ratio algorithms so like here's the CZ uh, the CWIFS OC4 version 4 algorithm for chlorophyll well what it says is you have Bands, you look at the ratio of 443 to 555, 490 to 555, and 510 to 555. Look at those three ratios. Take the maximum, take the log of that, and plug it into this formula, which is now through fourth power, and that's your chlorophyll value. Or, um, well, I have, here's one for KD at 490. Here's MODIS algorithms for CDOM absorption and phytoplankton absorption. And once again, you're looking at ratios of two bands here and then plugging those into some big formula and you get what you want. And you look in the literature, there's dozens of these algorithms out there. And all they've done is once again, for uh, the first one here, for example, here's the 443 to 555, 90 to 555, and 510 to 555. Whichever one of those was the maximum is plotted here and then the chlorophyll. And now we have a little curved function here. That first one I showed you, it was just a straight line, but you look at more data in a little more detail and you decide that, well, maybe it's really not linear. I should have at either low ratios or high, you know, some kind of curve. So the solid line here is simply this equation right here, the best fit through the middle of that. So that's now a fancier algorithm, but it's still just looking at band ratios. And all of these are the same thing. They've taken their data for KD at 490 and they've fit some curve to it. And here's the equation that gives you KD at 490. And then like uh, Stramsky and Dedeke had uh, paper reviewing a whole bunch of these algorithms. So there's like the CZCS chlorophyll algorithm. There's the modus chlorophyll for case one water, modus chlorophyll for case two, and there's two versions of that one. And so there's the CWIFS chlorophyll algorithm. And if you want to do something really scary, do a bunch of hydrolyte runs. Let's say pick the new case one model, put in a bunch of different chlorophylls, generate the remote sensing reflectance spectra, and then 
plug those spectra into these different algorithms and retrieve the chlorophylls. In principle, they'll all give you the chlorophyll value that you use to run hydrolyte. In practice, you're going to have a big range of chlorophyll values for the different algorithms are going to give you significantly different answers for the same RRS spectrum and none of those chlorophylls will probably match the one that went into hydrolyte. The reason is these are formed from different data sets. They're all best fit to somebody's data set. So uh, it's a good exercise, but it can be kind of demoralizing sometimes. Uh, okay, one of the nice things about band ratios and one of the reasons they were chosen is that they're not all that sensitive to bad atmospheric corrections. So here's a couple of remote sensing reflectance spectra and the purple curve and the white curve were two different atmospheric corrections. Same uh, top of the, in this case it was an airborne system, but same top up here radiance, two different atmospheric corrections gave you two different sea surface level RRSs. Now, if you have an algorithm that's going to match these exact spectra, these are much different spectra. I mean, you know, there's factors of two difference here. So there are, there's a whole family of algorithms called spectrum matching algorithms that will take exactly this spectrum or this one and match it up and do your retrieval that way. Those algorithms really require very accurate radiometric and atmospheric corrections. And if you have that, you get good results. If you don't, you don't. On the other hand, if I just take the ratio, let's say, you know, this wavelength to this one, I get a number that's bigger divided by a number that's bigger and the ratio is something. Or on this curve, I get a smaller number divided by a smaller number, but the ratio might be about the same. So one of the great virtues of band ratio algorithms is that they're minimally sensitive to magnitude errors that you would get from, say, a bad atmospheric correction or bad radiometric calibration. Yeah? They still have a signal about atmospheric correction because it's not the same for the green and the blue, right? They still have a line from the infrared. Yeah, you know, I mean, these curves, they, they do have a little bit different shape, especially in the blue, and that's because of the different atmospheric corrections. Very Yeah. Each of, the, each of the satellites, they have like sensitive on the atmospheric correction between these these different bands, right? Yeah, so I'm not. Say, like if I use the, the blue in the 443 four three against yeah. the blue in the four ninety or something, yeah. they they have different kinds of uh, atmospheric correction compared to the you, same green. Method. Yeah, I mean, if I pick say uh, like four ninety to five fifty five, here I would be looking at say. Let's just call it uh, 220 divided by uh, 555. 220 divided by 300 versus I would be looking at, you know, 100 divided by, you know, 190 or something. And so the the numbers are different, but the ratios are less variable. Ken. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's minimally sensitive, but still will be differences. Um, okay, here's an example here of non-uniqueness. Here's a whole bunch of remote sensing reflectance spectra, and if you look at the ratio of 490 to 555, every one of these curves has the same ratio, which is about... Uh, 1.71 plus or minus 0.01. If you took that value and plugged it into that CWIFS algorithm, you'd conclude that the chlorophyll was about 0.6. Well, I cheated a little here. The chlorophyll was really about less than 0.2. I cheated a little because these are all influenced by bottom reflectance, so you wouldn't really use that algorithm anyway. But I just want to make the point that you can have a lot of different spectra here and they may have exactly the same band ratio value 
but they may be describing much different physical situations. In this case, it's different bottom types and different bottom depths, and so the algorithm is not applicable. But this illustrates the whole business of non-uniqueness, um, which is the plague of band ratio algorithms, whereas the nice thing about them is minimally sensitive to atmospheric correction problems. But law of conservation of misery, you know, you're good on one thing and then you're bad on the other. Okay, so here's another band ratio algorithm that I'll use to really show you the non-uniqueness business. Business. So Heidi Dearson, who will be here on uh, Monday, uh, she developed a band ratio algorithm for retrieving bottom depth in Bahamas waters. So she had a whole bunch of data, 3,600 data sets, where she had hyperspectral reflectance and depth values. So she went all around the Bahamas collecting this data. Here's her swarm of points, and she fits a nice little function through her data set. So she looks at the logarithm of the 555 to the 670 wavelength. Now remember 555, this is really, really clear water. You can see down to, you know, 30 meters. So there's a very clear wavelength. There's one where water has sort of pinned it down. So you're looking at those wavelengths because you want to have the pure water. It means you can't see the bottom very well. The very clear wavelength says you can see the bottom, so that ratio is what she chose to use. Here's her little best fit function, and there it is. So you take that ratio, plug it in, and you get the log of the bottom depth. And so if we had a ratio of, uh, you know, that's, uh, let's see, 10, 20. So a ratio of 25 would give you a bottom depth of like 4.8 meters, and it works quite nicely. Okay, so I borrow her algorithm. Here's another image from an area in the Bahamas. The red here is little islands. This is a big sandbar. This is uh, seagrass beds here. So I took her algorithm, ran it through this image pixel by pixel to retrieve the bottom depth. And what I get here, over the sandbar, the bottom depths are fine. So the scale over here says, like right here is two to four meters, out here is four to six, and then all of this area is zero to two meters. Now, I went snorkeling and I stood right here, uh, this little white area you see here, and I could just barely get my nose above the water. So I know the two meter depth retrieval there is about right. Out here, the water is really like as deep as uh, 10 or 11 meters, so it's sort of the 6 to 8 or the 8 to 10. Her algorithm retrieves 0 to 2, so it's totally wrong. So what went wrong there? Well, break out hydrolyte, we know the IOPs, we know this is bright sand, this is actually a dark seagrass bottom. Do some hydrolyte runs, and so I've now plotted her ratio these are curves generated by hydrolyte for a couple of different sets of IOPs and sand bottom and seagrass bottoms. And then here, here is the black line is her equation. So if you pick, say, a ratio of 25 and you come up and look at, let's say, the yellow curve here, which is one set of IOPs and a grass bottom, and that's typical of this water out here where it's a grass bottom, Okay, I can come up and I say, okay, I'll retrieve a four meter depth, or notice the orange curve bends back on itself. So there's a second solution at nine meters here. So for the same band ratio algorithm, I could either get a nine meter depth, which is kind of close to correct, or I get a four meter depth, which is totally wrong. And her curve, the black one, would say, if I come across, it's somewhere around one, two, three, four, you know, 4.8 meters or something. So this solution for the hydrolyte run is pretty close to correct. I'm sorry, uh, this one is pretty close to correct, but it's giving me back this one, which is what her formula gives, or, or sorry, her formula gives this number which is pretty close to this solution, but the correct solution is this one. 
So I really should have been getting like nine meters out here, not two or something like that. So there's an example of non-uniqueness. Now, there's nothing wrong with her model, except that you shouldn't apply it to water that's more than like five or six meters deep, because that was the deepest water she had in her data set. So you can't take a data set that has water from, you know, one to six meters and get this nice curve that works great and then go apply it to water that's 15 meters or 10 meters deep because you're just beyond the range of where your model is valid. Okay, so uh, if I actually plotted uh, here, the green curve is the bottom reflectance, so the seagrass spectrum plotted over here, and then the blue curve is RRS for the 9 meter depth, and the, the red curve is for the 4 meter depth. So at 4 meters, you're seeing a big effect on remote sensing reflectance due to bottom reflectance. At 9 meters, uh, not so much. That's a dark bottom, and so it's less effect. But both of these, if you looked at whatever it was, 550 to 6 whatever, they both have the same ratio, but they're really different spectra, and you get different bottoms. Yeah, I mean, people do all kinds of things like that. And, uh, but as long as you're, you know, as long as you're playing with a band ratio, you're throwing out magnitude information. And if you have well calibrated spectra that you can trust the magnitude, then you're better off using a spectrum matching technique that's using both the shape and the magnitude. The band ratio algorithms are really only using the shape of the curve to, to at least first order. Okay, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes you have you know, some data points, you can plot them up, chlorophyll versus the band ratio, and you can kind of look at that and say, oh, it's linear, or, you know, it's maybe a third order function will fit it, and you have some idea of what kind of function to start with to fit your data, and then life is good. Well, then the problem comes along is you have a bunch of data, let's say remote sensing reflectance at a bunch of different wavelengths, You'd like to use all of that information because here we're only using information in this case from 490 and 555. And we really had a sensor that measured 412, 443, 490, 555, 670. Why not try to use all of that information one way or another? And so the problem then is you don't have a nice little plot where you can plot one thing versus another one thing and look at it and say, oh yeah, I'll use a cubic equation for the fit. So in that case, you don't really know what this mathematical form of your model should look like if you have a bunch of different inputs. So that leads us to the neural network business. So the neural network, the idea here is you're going to have, as we'll see, what's called a multiprocessor computation. And it's based on the idea of how animal brains work and do uh, things kind of in parallel. And so the essence of a neural network is that you have a whole bunch of very simple processing elements or s places where we're going to make a simple decision, like yes or no. And then there's going to be <coughs> a high degree of connection between all of those elements, like all of our nerve cells are all talking to these other nerve cells. And there's going to be very simple input and output. We're going to put in real numbers. We're going to get a real number out. And then the real thing is that there's adaptive interaction between these elements. The neural network will be able to learn as it goes along, just like people do. So. These are useful when we don't know the mathematical form of the model that links input and output. And we need to have lots of examples 
of the behavior we, we, that we require for known inputs. So we need a lot of data where we know the input, we know the right answer, and we're going to use that data to train the neural network. And then uh, we don't have any preconceived notion of the structure of our model. We're going to let that come out of the neural network training, and we don't even have to worry about that in a sense. So here's the basic idea <coughs> of your brain. You have a, a neuron here, and there's going to be inputs coming into the neuron from other neurons. And what this neuron is going to do is look at the inputs. And maybe these two neurons are sending an electrical signal, and these two aren't. And this guy's going to decide, do I want to send an electrical signal downstream to all of the other neurons that I talk to? And it's simply, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And so then if it decides, well, these two inputs are big enough <coughs> that I need to tell everybody else about them, it'll send an electrical signal down here, and then this guy will say, well, do I need to send the signal to my neighbors, yes or no? So... Uh, when I first gave this lecture, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, neural networks were just starting to be used for things like uh, science. Uh, now they're ubiquitous. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll get to that in the next view graph. I thought it was this one. Um, here's kind of the idea. We're going to have what's called an input layer. And these are simply the inputs to our neural network. So these may be remote sensing reflectance at one wavelength, another wavelength. Then there's what's called the hidden layer. This is like the neuron. And all this hidden layer says is, I'm going to take the input, the first input, I'm going to weight it by some value, then I'm going to take the second input, weight it by some value, add those two together, maybe add in a bias value, and if the sum is less than some threshold, I'm not going to do anything. If the sum is greater than or equal to the threshold, I'll output a 1 and send that downstream. So that's like a neuron retrieving two electrical signals coming in and deciding whether to fire and send an electrical signal to his neighbors. Okay, so B is the bias, uh, T is the threshold. So all it has to do is two simple things. It takes the inputs, weights them, and sums them, and then compares the sum to, or the bias sum, to a threshold value, and then decides whether to output a value or not. So that's the essence of it. Now, today, neural networks are absolutely everywhere in the world. So, you know, I use Google Translate all the time, and uh, here's a nice Chinese phrase if you've seen the movie uh, Arrival. And I'm not big on science fiction, but Arrival is a fabulous movie. And get me started on the linguistics that's in Arrival, and I'll tell you all about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis and all of that. But there's this key phrase where this Chinese general is trying to decide if he wants to attack the aliens, and his wife says this, and I plug it into... Uh, the Google Translator, and it says, not a perfect translation. It says, in the war, there is no winner, only widow and orphans. Well, a good translation might be to say, in war, there are no winners, only widows and orphans. But that's good enough. And that's simply a neural network looking at this thing and giving you a passable translation. So it's not great literature, but it works. Yeah. 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 Well, is one view of this is the neural network is actually just going to be a big nonlinear fit to your data. Because in general, th th you could argue that this is a linear fit right here. But when we got a lot of inputs and a lot of hidden layers, then it becomes an uglier problem. But yeah, this is still really amounts to curve fitting. And I'll show you that in a minute. It's just the best fit to data. Yeah. Isn't one of the I mean, isn't one of the appeals of using them that you can for that um, if, if, sorry if you go back um, for your whatever transition equation you're using in the hidden layer, you can use a nonlinear equation. So they end up being better for actually modeling nonlinear processes. Isn't that kind of one of the 
You know, I don't know what the latest is. I've never seen them where they do anything other than a linear, you know, input times weight plus input times weight and sum those up. Now, you're thinking maybe you use like, you know, x2, w2 squared or something and yeah, get an, yeah. I mean, I guess you can do that, yeah. I just haven't seen it and, you know, this, I don't know what the latest is on these things, but. Um, they have multiple layers anyway, so effectively you can kind of build that by having chain engine one year and after another. Yeah, so we'll see that in a minute, yeah. So anyway, uh, here's another one, big article on Google, of course, is massively invested probably of billions of dollars in developing neural networks. So here's a little article out of some Wired magazine. And what they did, they don't quite say it right here, but they take, um, you know, they have 16,000 computer processors and a billion connections between them. And then they show this thing, a bunch of cat pictures, and say, you know, this is a cat, this is a dog, and the neural network learns to recognize cats versus dogs versus people. And so then when you go to Google Image and say, show me pictures of cats, it looks through all the pictures it has and says, oh, this one's a cat, show it to him. And it's amazingly how well it works. Um, and here it says, uh, you know, after being presented with 20,000 different items, blah, 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 it began to recognize pictures of cats. Uh, this was despite being fed no information or distinguishing features that might help it identify one. So it's simply being given an image and it's presumably looking some way pixel by pixel and doing whatever and it learns that this thing is a cat, that's a cat, you know, that's a cat. And rarely does you, will you get a picture of a dog in here. You know, you can find one, and there's been some really embarrassing situations for them where, you know, it would identify a person as a monkey or something. But it's still pretty impressive that this is all hands-off neural networks. And I was reading up on this one time, and there was a picture of a room full of servers. And the room was like maybe about, uh, I don't know, let's say four meters by five meters or something. And it was just banks of, like, hundreds of servers and the guy said this is our cat neural network was all the servers in this room yeah yeah well that's the catch because under the neural network there's simply the data you use to train it so if you take the neural net and you apply it to another situation that looks physically kind of like the one you were working in, so similar water body, let's say, it's applicable. If you trained your neural network on, you know, cats and dogs, and then you apply it to monkeys, it's not going to work because they weren't, the monkeys weren't in the training set. Uh, you go say, give me all your code and your databases of all of these weighting factors and stuff. No. Yeah, you, you get the structure of the neural network and the value of the weights that they have determined from training. And that then defines the neural network. So uh, we'll see that in a minute. This is the future, this, this is the future of uh, automatic taxonomy in, in oceanography. All the images we're taking now with floating and with the IFCB, currently they don't use this. They use geometric. They get like 60 different geometric parameters for each image and they try to match it to, uh, to species to images to things that we've seen and, and it does not work very well. 
common one of the common uh, attractions I hear about this is black boxes or black. You know, how how does the community kind of view that? Plug something in, get something out. So that, that's what but I. But that's I'm really personal. Right, and, and that should be. I am the, definitely a dig in. I want to understand the links exactly. and stuff. I I see if you want an answer, yeah. this is the way to go. If you need if you do regulatory work or and you need an answer to this core fill increase or what can I predict out of you know the input of nutrients to this environment, this gives you an answer and it gives you, you know, uncertainties, etc. But if you want to know why something might be happening, it's it's not Here's a couple of more papers. It's neural nets are now being used for a lot of medical diagnoses. And the nice thing is that the neural network removes the human bias from making the diagnosis. The bad thing is it removes the human intuition of saying, well, you know, Kurt's gizzard is like a little bad on the x-ray, but I know him and this is, he's a sea kayaker and they tend to party a lot, and so that's probably really what's going on. It's not really cancer. So on the other hand, the guy says, uh, well, you know, I'm, I, uh, I, I know Mobley, and he's like a total loser, so yeah, he's undoubtedly sick when he's really not. So it's either a bias or an insight, depending on whether it benefits you or hurts you. Um, the Maris... Ocean color retrieval algorithms are a neural network, and it was trained by a, a pseudo data from a gazillion hydrolyte runs. And there's a nice comment here, I guess it was in this paper. It says, the advantage of neural networks is that they not only achieve higher retrieval accuracy than more traditional techniques such as band ratio algorithms, but they also allow the inclusion of superfluous or unused information such as geometric parameters and atmospheric visibility. So you may have this data set and it's got remote sensing reflectances, it's got sea surface temperature, it's got uh, you know the phase of the moon or whatever. You just give it all to the neural network and let the neural network decide do I need to know sea surface temperature to predict chlorophyll or do I do that just from RRS? And you'll never know inside the neural network really what's going on. You just know that you get a value out. And maybe the value of sea surface temperature was totally irrelevant, but you can still put it in there and it won't throw things off. Emmanuel. And, and that's an extremely well. I mean, currently, mostly only get growth out of the Salad and something, it's going to tell you whether you needed it at all or 
Okay, so let's take a little deeper look at these things now. So the essence, if you wish, of a neural network is that it can learn from available data. And that's called trading the neural network. And so you have to have a data set where you know the inputs and you know the right answer. And we're going to see how you use that to basically generate values for all these little weights that connect all the different inputs and outputs and neurons. So there's a technique I'll show you here in a second called backpropagation of errors. So you know the inputs, you know the outputs, you feed the inputs in, you see how it compares with the output, and then you kind of back up and tweak the weights until you keep getting the right answer. So we'll see how that works here. Okay. Okay, so here's our little neural network. It's got two inputs, one processor, and it puts out one value. Simple as you can get. Okay, so we're going to train this guy now. And here's, here's how it's going to go. Okay, so here's our training data where we've got four sets data set number one, two, three, and four, so you can think of chlorophyll at four different locations in the ocean. And in the first set, both of the inputs are zero, and the desired output will be zero. And the second training set, the first input's zero, the second one's one, and the right answer is for the output will be one, and then one zero and one one. So in this little example, if either one of our inputs is 1, we want to get an output of 1. And if both inputs are 0, we want to get an output of 0. So this is our training set. OK. The weights, remember, are these W things. So we have x1 and x2 are the inputs. We have a weight here. I guess I should draw it like this. Here's our processor. So here's W1. W2, the processor is going to take X1, W1, plus X2, W2, compare it with a threshold, and either output a 0 or a 1. Well, we start out with a couple of guesses for the weight. So you can just pull those out of the air, or maybe you have some idea. In this case, it just said, let's let the first weight, our guess will be 0.1, and the second weight here will be 0.2, or, sorry, 0.3. So you look at the first value in your training set. Both inputs are 0. You multiply that times the weight. So 0 times 0.1, 0 times 0.3, both of those are 0. You add them up. They both get 0, so we sum them up. The threshold here was going to be 0.5. So if this sum here, x1, W1 plus X2, W2, if that's less than 0.5, we don't do anything. And if it's greater than 0.5, we're going to output a 1. OK, so we take our values, initial guess for the weights, sum it. It's less than 0.5. The output is 0. The right answer is 0. So there's no error. So we don't do anything. We're happy. Now. We go to the next iteration. So we're going to look at the second value in our training set. Now the input for the first one is 0, and the second one is 0.1. So we take 0 input times the weight is 0. Uh, input times the weight is 0.3. We sum them. Those are 0.3. It's uh, less than the threshold, so we output a 0, but the right answer was 1. So we made an error of size 1. Now there's what's called the learning rate. And in this case, it's 0.2. So if you get the wrong error, you take the error times the learning rate, and you add that to the weights where you had a non-zero input. So we're going to take 0.2, and this one had a non-zero input, so we'll add 
1 times 0.2 to 0.3 is 0.5. This one had a zero input, so we're not knowing whether it's doing anything or not. So we leave that alone. So now, after looking at the second value in our training set, uh, we have weights of now 0.1 and 0.5. So let's go now to the next iteration, uh, third iteration. We're going to look at the third value in our training set. So now we have 1 times 0.1 is 1. Now the second one here has a 0 input, so that's 0. Sum these, 0.1, it's less than 0.5. We output a 0. Well, we wanted to have a 1. That was the right answer. So we made an error of size 1. We take that times the learning rate. And up here, this one now had a non-zero value. So we take 0.2, add it to the old value, 0.1. We have a new weight of 0.3. This guy had zero input, so we just leave him alone. So now the new weights are 0.3 and 0.5. OK, let's go to the next iteration. Now we're going to look at the fourth training set. OK, input is 1 times 0.3 is 0.3. Input is 1 times 0.5 is 0.8. Sum is 0.8. The threshold is 0.5. The sum is greater than the threshold, so output a 1. And the right answer was a 1, so we didn't make any error. OK, life is good, so we don't change the weights. Now go back and go through the training set again. Next iteration. Number five, we go back to here. Zero times zero is zero, da -da, less than zero, less than 0.5. Output is zero, the answer is zero, there's no error, we're cool. Go back and do the second value in the training data set. Now we're inputting zero. Um, I wonder what it's unhappy about. Okay, zero times 0.3, one, that's 0.5. The sum, uh, if it's less than or equal to the threshold, it outputs a zero. The right answer was one, so now there's an error. So now 0.2 gets added into here, so 0.5 plus 0.7. This one had a zero input. Don't mess with it. All right, now go to the next guy here. So, so Kurt, yeah. You get, well, you, yeah, you get to pick the learning rate. Yeah. And, you know, I could have used 0.1, I could have used 7. And it, and it might take longer to converge and all of that. But basically, th there's a real black art here mm -hmm. um, of, well, if the learning rate is too small, it just takes longer to learn. If it's too big, maybe you keep going back and forth like this. In one case, here's the right answer, and you go, ding, 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 and it's really slow. And the other one, you go back and forth like this. You really want the one that'll converge, and there's no magic answer to what value to use. Like, just like the initial guesses, you could pick whatever, and hopefully you may get a different set of final weights, but they'll still give you the right answer. Okay, so anyway, here we are now. We're looking at... Uh, uh, input number three, it's one and zero, so we have a point three plus a zero. We output a zero. Oops, the answer's one. Error, multiply times two. That gets added to the one where there's a non-zero input. Now I have weights of 0.5 and 0.7. Okay, go to the next value in the training set. One times 0.5, da-da, it's 1.2, it's greater than that. Output's one, the right answer's one, no error. Now go back, go through the training set again. Next iteration. Okay, zeros, zeros go in, zero comes out, that's correct, no error. Go to the next one. We're now number two here. 0.5 times zero is zero, one times 0.7, that's greater than one, 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 yep, that's right, there's no error, leave things alone. Go to the next one. Three, so a 0.5 goes in, that one's zero. Ah, it's not greater than, so it outputs a zero. So I still go back and I add my 0.2 to this, and now I have weights of 0.7 and 0.7. Okay, try the next one. And there I get the right answer. 
Now I go back to the beginning and go through the training set again. And now I'm getting zeros and I get out a zero. Life is good. I get out a one. That's okay. Life is good. I get out a one here. Life is good. No error. I go to the last one. Once again, I get out no error. So now I can just, I have a set of weights that always gives the right answer. So now if I go through the thing again, you know, I just keep getting zero errors and I never change the weights again. So I have now trained the neural network, which means I have found a set of weights that given the inputs always gives me the output that I want. So that's the training business. Okay. Sir? Yeah. So the training Yeah, so the first thing you have to do is determine the weights, which is the training. And then you will use these now you're going to take the neural network and give it some new inputs, in this case like a new remote sensing reflectance, and hope that those weights that the data set you used to train it was similar to your water body so that a new remote sensing reflectance will give you a good chlorophyll. And we'll see that in just a minute. I have one more yeah. Question. For this, we need to know what the output we want. That's the point. You have to have a data set where you know the inputs and the outputs. And that's what you use to train the neural network. Then once it's trained, you only know the inputs, so you, but you, you know the weights. And so you take the inputs, the weights, and you get an answer, which might be a chlorophyll. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So, yeah, so in this one, if the sum is higher than the threshold value, it outputs a 1. If it's less than or equal, it outputs a 0. That's just the way they did this example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, if I had just made a lucky guess and picked 0.7s for the initial weights, I'd go through this thing a couple times and realize I'm done. If I picked a different learning rate, you know, it might take longer or faster to get to the answer. Or I might have, you know, different weights here, then it would still reproduce the outputs. Yeah. Well, it, either, one of, either one of them, all you can ask is that it reproduces the right answer. You're, it, you don't care what the weights were, or what the final weights were. It doesn't matter as long as they give you the right answer. Let's say this is the weight 
That's the next X view graph here. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about that coming up. Yeah. So now if you have a satellite data spatial query, you would have different weights from different areas? Or would it always be the same weights used? Well, you've got a set of weights that go with a data set. Now, your data set may be chlorophylls and remote sensing reflectances at different locations in different times. But that's your data set, and you get a, a, a set of weights for that data set. But could you get a set of weights for the same area in the Atlantic, and then yeah. a different weight? Yeah, for yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they really, I mean, in a sense, you could have one big neural network that's all of the North Atlantic. Or you could say, I'm going to have a neural network for the Gulf of Maine and one for the Sargasso. So you partition your data sets, and now you probably have better performance here and better performance there, quite possibly. Okay, we'll see how that works in a second here. Okay, so go back to uh, here. And... Okay, so the things to note there were that we use the training data to determine the weights. For a given input, it produced the right output. And then in the real world, we hope that, you know, in a more complex network, we'll put in new weights that are not in the training data set and we'll still get good outputs. But the real essence here is the knowledge or the memory of the neural networks is contained in the weights. Um, and, of course, in a real situation, you have to have, you know, enough neurons to capture the science, but you don't want to be looking at noise. So that's what comes next. Um, oh, just a comment here. Another way to view this is that you have a big model here with a whole bunch of unknown parameters, which are the weights, and you determine those unknown parameters as a big nonlinear least squares fitting problem. So that's another way to do the determine the weights rather than the back propagation of errors. You just say, I've got you know this big mess of equations. 